Welcome. Um, welcome to worship at Siesta Key Chapel. Do we have any guests here that this time they've been to the chapel? Would you like to stand and introduce yourself, say where you're from? Glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Well, welcome. This is their first time here, and I met them in between. They thought the service was at 10 o'clock. <laughs> so they got me for an hour. <laughs> but we had the best time, and these folks are looking for a church, and they found one. And so you don't even have to work on them. <laughs> now they're here. Welcome. welcome. Go ahead. Thank you, and all of you are welcome to come back. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, it's such a blessing to have people come into our church and and everyone that participates in fellowship here welcoming them also so that they will come back. We're fortunate, very fortunate, to have in the pulpit today Dr. Robert Stamps. He's a professor of theology, a writer, a novelist, composer of hymns, pastor, and best of all, he's been our theologian in residence this month. We benefited from his wealth of, no of experience and knowledge and We've enjoyed him in our adult education classes and the School of Christian Living. Ellen Stamps will be doing our children's sermon today. She has contributed to our PW meetings, teas, coffees during this month, sharing her personal experiences, and in particular the experiences she, uh, when she accompanied Corey Ten Boom for nine years. Please note in your bulletin the list of opportunities this week, including the uh, School, of Living, School of Christian Living class from Wednesday evening, come for dinner at five, and hear Dr. Stamp's inspirational class at six o'clock. Also notice the announcements in the back of the bul bulletin about the SAC lunch. Um, you're welcome to come here at 12 noon on Thursday. It's a golden opportunity to ask questions and further enhance the experiences that we have had this month with these two wonderful Christians. I'd like to also mention that next Sunday in our fellowship hall, at 10 o'clock there will be a panel on homeless. At right after the 11 o'clock service, you will be able to meet our mission partners and you'll have opportunities to sign up to serve or just talk to these people or what, what they do and how important our mission is with them in, the, in their work. Next Sunday is also the Kirken worship of the Tartans. You'll hear bagpipes, see dancers, and enjoy haggis. I, I, I use that term loosely, enjoy. But, uh, so please join with me in the call to worship from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. 
I will praise the Lord as long as I live. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord lifts those who are bowed down. Praise the Lord. Let us worship the living God. There is a printed prayer in our bulletin. Please say it with me in unison and follow it with your own silent confession. O oh God, we confess that we have not found ourselves lacking in knowledge of truth, righteousness, or justice. The faith once given to the saints has not been tried and found wanting. Rather, we have tried it and found it difficult. We seek easy answers and simple conclusions. We desire understanding without struggle, morality without commitment, and living without hard decisions. We often are angry because the knowledge of God places demands on our lives. Forgive us. Grant us grace to struggle and strength to endure. In Christ's name, hear now these silent prayers.
Proclamation of Forgiveness, Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Friends in Christ, we are forgiven. Be reconciled to God. Um, we have received some prayer requests for today. Brooke Schaefer, a friend um, with cancer, and Kathy McElroy, a friend with cancer. Also, I would ask you to review the list of our friends and families in your bulletin that need our prayers. We also uh, note that we uh, lost this week Howard Kaler and Eugene Dew on February 14th. We'll keep them in our prayers. Amen. Is this going to rub on this? Is that all right? I think it's all right. Dear people, rend your hearts, rend your hearts and not your garments. For your transgressions, the prophet Elijah have sealed the heavens through the word of God. I therefore say to ye, forsake your idols, return to God, for he is slow to anger. And merciful and kind and gracious and repenteth him of the evil. Give with all your hearts, he truly sees. He shall ever surely find me, the serf of God. Filled with all your heart, he truly seek me. He shall ever surely find me, the serf of God. The I knew where I might find him, that I may even come before his presence. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might even come before his presence. Come before his presence. Oh, that I knew well I might find him. If with all your heart ye truly seek me, 
Thank you, John. You have blessed us, brother. I also want to say a word of appreciation to the choir. Um, we're just visitors here, my wife and I, for a few days. But uh, I am very impri- um, impressed with the, the choir, and I heard them rehearse this morning. It's a wonderful thing. If you get here at 10 o'clock, you can just hear the choir rehearse. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. And now you're in for a real treat. Uh, My best friend is here, my wife, best friend for 45 years. And uh, my wife is many things. You've already heard Brenda um, introduce her. But she's uh, also a a, a wonderful mentor to children. We've just come back from four years in a, in a family community attached to a seminary for uh, four years with over 150 children. Seminary is a good place to have babies, by the way. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's not in the water. Uh, so I want Ellen to say, if, uh, to give the children's sermon. And I, I don't, let's see who, let's see some children. Let you do it. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. And this church needs children. And you only get children if you're willing to become a child. So let me just say it now. If you feel like a child, come. (laughs) At the first service, people started to walk. Anyone? Wow, I can't believe it. Here they come, here they come. Good, there they come. That's what happens with children. You give them a little time. <laughs> oh, good, good. Oh, oh now they're going to good. sit down. Oh. Okay, here we are. You know, I think this is the example. Maybe uh, some of you, it's so nice when you don't have children. But really, the future is children. And so this church, we are going to pray that this church is going to be so blessed that if I come back in five years with a grandchild on my hip, there will be more grandchildren and children here. So that will be a blessing and what a church it is. I mean, it's almost like you're hiding this place from the world. <laughs> so, well, children's... Okay, so here we are. Children, Sharon, do you know Jesus? Yeah, look at that. She knows Jesus. That helps. And she just came forward in our little circle. And it is so wonderful that today the pastor is telling a story about Matthew's house. And you know, Jesus was never afraid for sinners. Now, when I was small, I had no idea what a sinner was. What a strange word that is. And maybe none of us know. But here we are in this little circle of grown-up children. And... One of the things that I had to learn in my life is that God's house is always open. His heart is open for sinners. Well, I grew up during the war, Second World War. Now you know how old I am. I was born in 1940. And when I went for the first time to school, I was six and I couldn't even speak the right Dutch because I had lived in another part of Holland. And so I came home, I had a lot of hang-ups. And the one thing was that it was hard to make friends when you don't speak the right language. Oh, how can you win friends? So I got an idea. One morning, my mother gave me a quarter, and I had to pick up a pound of sugar in the little shop. We had only one little shop. And so I went out, and then I stood there, and the sugar wasn't, didn't come in plastic bags or in paper bags. They had to weigh it and put it in, and that was it. And so <laughs> when she turns her back towards me, I saw little pieces of gum. I didn't know what gum was, but I had heard from Americans that they chew chewing gum. And that must be exciting. So while she was turned, I quickly picked out and peace and put it in my pocket and so I came home and mothers are very strange (laughs) all these mothers your children you don't know that but mothers can look through your pockets (laughs) (laughs) then I came home and I put the sugar on the kitchen table and I was almost ready to sit down 
Mama said, what is there in your pocket? And I said, nothing, nothing. And she said, can you just take out what you have in your pocket? And I pulled out the chitlets, chitlets, what are they called? And she said, where did you get them? I said, in the store, where did we get the sugar? And but how did you get them? Well, I just took them. <laughs> ah, you took them. And so Mama said, we are going to bring those pieces of gum back to the store. So then I got them back. And Mama said, my daughter has something in her hand that she needs to give back. And I gave it to the little lady. And I said, I am so sorry. I took. Mama said, no, you didn't take it. You stole it. <laughs> you stole it. And now I want you to give those back to this woman to whom it belongs. And this dear woman looked at me. And my whole dream of going to school with 10 pieces of gum and making friends was gone. I gave him back and she looked at me and she says, I forgive you. Dr. Stems is going to tell today's story about Matthew's house. What happens there is like my little story in the shop. Bless you, children. Have a great day. <laughs> Well, um, someone said, are you taking Tom's place this morning? Nobody takes Tom's place. <laughs> but I'll get my foot in the door, at least to, uh, to love Tom's people. And by the way, he loves you very, very much. He's told me so several times. I've already uh, thanked Cynthia and the choir. I also want to thank uh, the cooks. Linda's here this morning. Bob was here the first service. Um, and for Brenda and her team, and put all this together, and especially Tom, um, for the invitation. Tom and I have a lot of things in common. Uh, our theology is very close to each other. Him being a Presbyterian, me being a Methodist, is not really as different as they think. And, of course, we have something also that we don't have in common with some of you. <laughs> this handsome guy here, can you imagine? If I had hair like that, I'd, I'd just die and go to heaven. But, but give, me a, give me a few weeks, will you? Um, I was told by Margaret, my favorite uh, Presbyterian elder lady, to, I, she reminded me that we're not really going to have communion next Sunday. It's going to be when these Presbyterians dance around in their dresses. It's going to be uh, uh, Tartan Sunday, I believe. And you're going to enjoy that, but I kind of think Tom might surprise you with communion because I told him I was going to be preaching a sermon this morning in preparation for the Eucharist next week. Um, well, if it's not next week, it'll be the week after or the week after. And uh, I think you're going to get the point, and the point is not going to end at the communion table. Trust me. I ask the Lord now to bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, but not just me, Lord, but bless the ones that are hearing. And your Holy Spirit is the one who brings to remembrance those things that are true. And I pray that this morning, the, the great rememberer in our presence, the Holy Spirit, would, would keep some of the stuff that I say this morning to the glory of God. Amen. Well, I asked him, uh, I told him that I'd be preaching in preparation of communion, and I, yes, that's true, but no, not exactly. Because I'm not going to talk to you this morning about what most people think preachers talk about or think about when it comes to communion. I, um, as far as, I've, as I remember from my own PhD studies, and I actually did it on the Eucharist, so I'm going to give you about an hour and a half this morning. No, I promise I won't. I must have read, by the way, I did it on a Presbyterian theologian, so that I, I pass already. I must have read 10,000 pages on what God does or Jesus does in relationship to bread and wine. I didn't read 500 pages 
on what God does for people at the Eucharist. John Wesley, there I go, John Wesley has a great line. He says, at the Eucharist, the blessed Jesus comes with miracles in his hands and every miracle full of grace. Will you say amen to that? It's not what happens to bread, but what happens to people there. And I pray that after this message today, you will anticipate a miracle at the next Eucharist for you. Not just to the bread, but in your heart. Let's go. Now, if Christ is really here at the table, as we believe that he is, and Christians do believe that he's truly here, God has gone to a lot of trouble, you know, for Christ to be present at this table whenever, and even at your table in your house. He has come in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, to dwell among us. And by the way, the word dwell doesn't just mean visit. It means come to stay in our flesh. Jesus has come to stay in our flesh, in his incarnation. And then to hold our mortal flesh into immortality, he died and took it through death that it could live forever, that you and I could live forever, and that he would always be the risen Christ present to Christians. And finally, he's not done. Finally, in the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, he comes to live among us forever. He doesn't have a name, or does he, the Holy Spirit? Paul calls him the Spirit of Jesus, Jesus present in our lives and at our table. So what does the risen Christ, this is really the question, what does the risen Christ really want to do for us at the table? John Wesley, I've quoted him twice now. John Wesley says, at the table, we have the real presence of the real Christ. The real presence of Christ come to change our lives. I had a child once who got A-L-T-A-R and A-L-T-E-R mixed up. And she said, uh, I said, now what is it? It was a confirmation class. Well, what is this? And she says, well, that's the altar where we have our lives altered. How do you like that for theology, huh? The real presence of a real encounter with the Christ who can change our lives. Let me read the text now. What does Christ want to do? At the table, he wants to give us something that we can't keep, that we have to give away. See in this text if you can hear Jesus say it. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax booth. Matthew's other name was Levi, which probably meant that he was from a priestly family in Israel. It's a long way from a priestly family to a tax collector. He was sitting in his tax booth and Jesus said to him, follow me, and he got up and he followed Jesus. And then he invited him to dinner that evening at the house. That is, Matthew invited Jesus to his house. And Matthew brought his friends other tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your, ta your teacher, the rabbi, eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Here's the hint. Here it comes. Go and learn what this means, Jesus said. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
says the Lord. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, what was the greatest act of worship in the Jewish religion? It was the act of sacrifice. At least once a year, hopefully three, four times a year, a Jew was required to go to temple and to offer sacrifice. Sacrifice for their own sins. So what did they receive in sacrifice? Mercy. Mercy over themselves, over their house, over their prosperity, over their posterity. Mercy was what was received. Now what Jesus was saying here to the Pharisees, can you imagine now what God really wants from you, he said, is not what goes on in church, but what you do with church, with what you receive there. You receive mercy in the service of sacrifice. Now give away mercy. That's what God is interested in most. That's what he desires. Jesus said it himself in Luke chapter 6. Be merciful as your Father has been merciful to you. There it is. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I'm sure God likes to go to church. But God likes more than church to see church go back into the world. We'll never turn the world upside down inside church. You've got to be in the world to turn it. A cousin of mine said that in the Civil War. You've got to be in the world to turn it. And preachers stay in church. You go to the world. We're the clergy. You are the ministers. Now I want to say a word about the background for this text we've read. And it's a sad background, but a wonderful one too. Sad for the Pharisees but beautiful for the world. In the Near East, if someone invited you to dinner, you had to sort of refuse it because it was such an honor. We, I was raised in East Texas, and in East Texas, if somebody wanted to give you something, you had to say, oh, no, 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 I don't, you know, I, I, you don't want to do that for me, you know. And then you had to accept it because it was an honor, right? I can still hear my Uncle Armin telling my father that he didn't want my father to pay the check uh, at the fish fry. And, of course, he didn't want to pay it himself, and he was tickled to death. My dad did, and finally he said, all right, I'll do it next time. Well, the truth of the matter is, you couldn't refuse an invitation to a table. It was an, an affront. If someone invited you to their table, to their dinner, you had to accept it. And Matthew invited Jesus to the table. Because you see, the invitation was a statement of your friendship toward the one who you invited. You were their friend at least for the time that that person sat at your table. Listen, let me just tell you this. I didn't say this in the first service. If you, if you came into someone's table, uh, invited us into someone's house, you were put in the corner and the table was put in front of you and your host sat in front of you across the table. And even if your enemy came in to kill you, they would have to get over the host to get to you. Now you know what it means. I make a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Now that's real friendship. And that's the way the table was arranged in Matthew's house, but it's better than that. If you, ex if you went into a, to a someone's house, answered the invitation, you were declaring your friendship for that person. At least for the time you were in that meal, and I guarantee you Jesus had more in mind than three hours. 
You were the friend to Matthew. I mean, Levi, the tax collector. My God. A rabbi. Friend of sinners. You have to know that as far as the, the, the Sadducees were concerned, the affront wasn't the sinner. That was the outcast. The affront was that you crossed over the doorway of the sinner. Immediately you were unclean. Jesus would have had to go back and go to a ritual washing before he could ever go back to church again. In fact, the Pharisees couldn't even touch him for fear that they would get the dirt that Matthew had put on him, spiritual dirt, and would, have to be, and would be, become unclean themselves. It was a terrible situation. The, it's, it's a case where religion has become the absurd. But you see, there was more cleanliness in Jesus than there is dirt in the world. Somebody say amen to that. You'll never get him dirty. But he's liable to get sinners clean. My God. Oh, let me tell you, the crowd was something. There wasn't a friend of a Pharisee in the bunch. There were other tax collectors, and I'm sure the local madam was there too, the prostitute. Probably a couple of Roman officials who collaborated with the tax collector for the little extra that he would always get uh, when he was working on you for the IRS. Then I'm sure there was a North Carolina pig farmer there. <laughs> Jews don't... Jews don't really like uh, pig farmers. And then this is very interesting. There was probably someone there who had to have help to even get in the house. You see, the, Jewish, the, Jew, the uh, Pharisees at that time believed that if you had a physical ailment, if you'd broken your foot and it was crooked, if you had rheumatism and couldn't get out of bed, you were cursed by God because evil answers Sin. So if something had happened to you, evil, you had to have sinned to have been made that way by God as punishment. What we do to religion, what we do to God's character and God's goodness, how absurd. Remember when they walked up to the gate, beautiful? And, and the disciples said they saw a man who was uh, was he blind or crippled? I've just, it slipped my mind. They, let's just say he was blind. Look, look at there. There's a blind man there at the, at the at gate, beautiful. Uh, who caused him to be blind? Was it his sin or was it the sin of his parents? Jesus said, neither one. And that was it. And put it out of your mind forever. Aren't you glad he went to the temple that day? And said just that. You see, the Pharisees didn't like people who weren't like them, who weren't holy and clean as they were. The fact that he called an unclean man a tax collector to be part of his disciple band was bad enough. And then he went in and became friends to sinners. And a rabbi? What are you, what's wrong with your rabbi, they said to the disciples. By the way, the disciples wouldn't even come into the place. Luke, Matthew implies that they were sitting with Jesus at the table, but Luke clarifies it. No, they were standing outside. They wouldn't go with Jesus as close to sinners as he wanted to be. He went into the house with them. He sat down with them. They stayed outside with the Pharisees and were very upset themselves with Jesus that the Pharisees were so upset with him too. We know for a fact that they didn't go in. You know why? Boy, you're talking about politically incorrect. You're about to hear, hear something. In Luke's uh, account of the early church in the 10th chapter of Acts, Peter uh, goes for the first time into the house of Cornelius. Cornelius the Gentile, who had received the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way. He couldn't deny that God had saved poor old Cornelius. 
And he walks across for the first time, across the doorway into a Gentile's house. And this is what he says. Oh, you've received the Holy Spirit like we did. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been in the house of an unclean person. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Now, you ought to be, you know, asking me, you know, all this stuff about communion, the Lord's Supper, all this about that, and, and you're talking about Matthew's house? This isn't Matthew's house. Uh, look around. I mean, there are no, well, there is a pig farmer from North Carolina, but, you know, they're, they're, we're not like that bunch. What we really are, it, we're like the, the disciples were at the Passover meal. That's really the, that's analogous to the Lord's Supper better. Why didn't you talk about that this morning? Uh-oh. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread in his hands and he said, this is my body that will be broken for you tomorrow. He took the cup in his hand, poured the, the wine into it, and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you tomorrow. And that night, Matthew chapter 26, verse 56, the worst verse in the Bible. They deserted him and ran away. There's not a person in this house that's committed a more despicable sin than that. Even the Passover meal in the upper room was Matthew's dinner table. So it's all about mercy, and it's all about mercy continuing to keep the mercy going. That's what it's all about. It's all about mercy in Matthew's house. And whenever Tom gets around to it, it'll be about mercy in this house. We have to keep the banquet on the table. And the banquet just begins at church. I have two wonderful friends here uh, from Washington State. Uh, Doug Clark and his wife Sandy, they were students of mine back in the 1970s and 80s. We're all getting older. Doug said to me yesterday that if, as far as evangelism is concerned in the future, it's not going to be at Billy Graham meetings. Uh, friends of mine say, who's going to be the next Billy Graham? There's probably not going to be one. We're going to have to do it. You say, well, I, you know, I don't know how to do it. I'm not talking about li little tracks and, you know, uh, plans to, to bring somebody to Christ. That's important, but that's probably not what you're going to do. You're just going to have to have dinner at Matthew's house for people who don't think they should be there. And maybe they'll get around to asking you where, where you learned to be so kind. My friend Doug said, there's not going to be any evangelism without kindness and hospitality. Hospitality. That's dinner. That's love. I'm not just talking about the unchurched either. I'm talking about people that perhaps you're uncomfortable with. That you perhaps not want to do it except that you know love so deep in your own heart from God you know God loves them too I'll name a few and by the way Ellen is my hero in this she's the one that puts us up to this and I've been retired since 2006 so I'm on your side of the evangelism program we were at a classical concert uh, it was uh, Sasson's organ Concerto. If you don't believe in the second coming of Christ, listen to the final movement of that and you'll believe in it. It's the most beautiful thing you ever heard. 
Nabu, Nabil Karuba was there. And um, we, we, I didn't know him. He was a brown-skinned fellow sitting next to Ellen. And, and sure enough, as, at the intermission, Ellen got to meet him. And within a matter of a few minutes, she had invited him to supper. He was a Muslim from Pakistan. And we asked him, uh, you know, we asked him a few questions, and he didn't seem to be real religious, although I found out later he had been to Mecca twice on a hajj. But he went to do his Ph.D. at the University of Delaware and gave up on his faith completely. Well, I knew he'd given it up because when he came, when he came to our house, he brought a bottle of wine. <laughs> I, I, I hate to, you know, I know some of us here are abstemious, but anyway, you don't have to give up your religion to have a glass of wine, do you? <laughs> well, anyway, Nabil uh, became a great friend, and uh, over many, many times, he's now living in Texas, but he, um, he, he, used to, he began to go to church with me, and um, at, it was a church where they celebrated the Eucharist every week. And week after week he would go, and it was classical music there like it is here, beautiful. And he, um, he loved it so much, and he kept coming back, and every week we went. One time we took him to the church in D.C. where I pastored for six years, and the pastor, we had a, it was an organ concert, he loved that, but the, the pastor preached on grace. And as we were coming back from D.C. to Richmond, he said, what does grace mean? And I said, it means God coming in mercy to love us, to help us. And he said, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. At one of those Eucharists, I turned around and there he was coming forward. And I didn't say, stop, stop. You haven't been baptized. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> I said, why did, you, why did you want to come tonight to the table? He said, I want what you have. Well, now I got the Muslims in. Now I'm about to get the communists in. <laughs> Prepare yourself. They still exist. I never dreamed it'd be a day when there weren't communists around. Now we, got, we still got China. Ellen and I fell in love with a couple. We were, we were at a kind of a conference, and we met this young communist couple in their 20s. They told me right away, we don't really want to go back. We want to stay here. And we love the freedom that's here. But that ruins the story. <laughs> anyway, they, Ellen invited them to come to dinner once, twice, three, four times. I got a call just day before yesterday from Richmond saying, can you come to dinner with us? I took them. You know, I'm sorry. I, I didn't take them to the Methodist church at I didn't take them to the Presbyterian church for Christmas. It was their first time to ever go to church. Sometimes there's too many words in our religion. We need some pictures. And I, so I took them to the Episcopal church. It was glorious. The candles, the beauty, the music. He walks in, the fine-looking young fellow and his beautiful wife. They walk in. They look around. Here's the baptismal thing. Which in beautiful colors, they have tiles of colors underneath the water. Is here's the candles, the reredos, the music, everything. He said, I feel fear. First time in church, technicolor. I feel fear. I said, What, what do you mean, fear? He says, Don't you feel it? I said, No. Then I realized, Awe. Oh, you feel awe, oh, don't you? That's what it is. Well, you know, we're a little older. We have to go to the bathroom sometimes. And I, I, I had to slip out real quick. And we sat on the front row, or not, uh, the back row, actually. And a fella in front, somebody just like you, turned around and said, you're new here. I want to show you how to follow the bulletin. They fell in love with it. All started at Matthew's table. Ooh. Jesus uh, told us a story about his own banquet that he was going to throw. 
and he had all these church people that he wanted to come, and he invited them one after another. Will, will you come, the Pharisees, you know? Will you come to my banquet? And one of them said, no, I got, a, I got tea time. That's golf, not sip. I got a tea time, just the wrong time. It, I can't make it. Then he asked another, a, a, a woman elder, and he said, to her, how about you? You'll be there, won't you? I got an appointment at the beauty shop. And then he asked the most pious elder, he said, you'll certainly be there, won't you? No, I've got a Bible study. Oh, brother. <laughs> and Jesus said to his disciples, go on out and get them. Go get the people who don't expect to ever be invited. Start with the poor. Those that have trouble getting in the house. They think they're cursed because they can't walk. People who would never think themselves worthy. Don't ever get confused about that text from Paul. Only go to the Eucharist if you're worthy to do so. You know what Luther said about that? If you think you're worthy at the table of the Lord, don't go. The ones who are worthy is the, are the ones who know they're hungry for grace and need the mercy of God. If you think you're not worthy, you are. Say amen to that. What I'm telling you is to just love the socks off the world. And somebody's going to say, uh, why are you like you are? And you're going to say, where I go to church, there's someone who loves me so much, I can't help it. All right. I have to save this to last because you won't ever get over it. I wrote this um, after an experience. Ellen is still the hero. But here we go. This is, uh, this is one... For the books, right out of Matthew's house. I was a, a, a chaplain at a Midwestern Christian university, and this happened one afternoon. I hated to burden my new bride, we'd only been married a week or two, with a surprise dinner guest, but there was a young man in my office I knew needed a taste of our family that evening. We'd only been married a few weeks. I knew she wasn't prepared, but I was hopeful she would understand. This was the first time I'd done this to her, but it wouldn't be the last time. <laughs> I was the chaplain at Midwestern Christian University and picked up a late phone call after the rest of the staff had gone for the day. It was one of the students who wanted to make an appointment with me. Here's what he said, after the staff has gone. When he entered my office, I knew from the tortured look on his face it was serious, and it really was. For over an hour, he poured out a chilling story of his involvement over the past few months in male prostitution at a premier hotel among the city's wealthiest people. He choked on his own tears, truly broken by the life he was living, and likewise seriously desiring to break with it. I was stunned. At this point in my young ministry, I'd heard of such things but couldn't imagine one of our students being caught up in it. Lost for words myself, I reached for my Bible hoping to find an appropriate word. The only scriptures I could think of was with prostitutes had Jesus sharing the, his grace and forgiveness with them. I was really struggling to find something to say that would help this young man and sometimes... There's not enough words to do it. Sometimes it takes more than words, even God's word. Awkwardly, we prayed together precisely what he'd expected a chaplain to do. But we both knew more had to be said and something had to be done. Embarrassed at my ineptitude, I excused myself for a moment. That's when an idea hit me. 
I went to the receptionist's desk and phoned my wife to say there was a student in trouble in my office, one who didn't need to eat alone. Could he come home with me? It just wasn't the night for the dining hall. When I returned, he was still weeping, overcome with his own confession. I comforted him best I could and suggested he come home with me for dinner, and he reluctantly agreed. On the way to the parking lot, we both grew quiet, unsure of what to say, and he followed me home on his Harley Davidson 300. As we entered the apartment, we were both startled to find that, ta that the table wasn't set for the dinner we expected. Ellen had covered the table with our finest linen cloth, a silver goblet of wine rested on it, as well as a silver plate with bread. She even had candles burning in the silver candlesticks we'd received at our wedding, but had never used. Ellen emerged from the kitchen, made the introductions, and she seemed overjoyed to have Steve join us. As startling as the whole evening must have been to him, he didn't hesitate to take his seat with us. He ran to the table. Looking at the elements of communion, I led a prayer of thanks to the Father, invoking the Spirit that Jesus might come and speak the words he spoke on another night to disciples who were about to do dark things. This is my body for you, Steve. This is my blood poured out for you and for the entire world for the remission of sins. Jesus spoke the words that night, words I couldn't find earlier, words and deeds. And with the words, he came himself in mercy to help our newfound friend. His presence was palatable around the table as Steve was deeply touched by God's forgiveness and his newfound acceptance at the table of mercy. Yes, we got around to the other meal. Ellen had prepared it. But neither of us can remember what she served that night. What we do recall was the laughter, the hope, and the love we shared all because of the first course that God served us. Just love the socks off the world. And they'll beat down the doors of the church. Amen. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your love that sent him here your love that gave him life again for us and your love that's kept him here in the Holy Spirit. Hear the praise of grateful hearts. Amen. Christ is alive. Is alive. Number 246. We'll stand as we sing.
Father, everyone in this place has the world on its heart. Everyone in this place desires peace on earth and goodwill to men. We pray that you'll make us instruments of that peace and always full of goodwill toward all, even those that we might not prefer goodwill upon. We pray for the leaders of the world that every hand by your hand would be toward the best, the flourishing of their peoples. We pray for our president, his advisors, the Congress. We pray that you will gird up their minds, guard their hearts, and guide their steps. We pray for peace in this country as we prayed it for the world. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and in our families. Many are estranged within them, perhaps even our own offspring. We pray mercy upon them, and we pray that they'll come home quickly or quickly as can. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bless all those who are our duty today to pray for. Those that Brenda has mentioned, particularly the family of that one deceased, we pray mercy upon the soul of that one already with you, but upon all the family that grieves. Dry every tear in time and in love. We pray for all those who are facing surgery this week or going to the doctor, or worrying about themselves or someone else. We pray peace upon all the house of God, upon the hands of the physicians. Mercy all, Lord, mercy all. And give us grace to open our hearts to the world, however you would have us do it. In the name of Jesus, who teaches us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God in God's faithfulness, has outpoured himself upon us in, bounty, in bountiful blessing. And we have opportunity now to respond to God's grace and to give back what God has given us. The ushers will come forward.
For all that we've received at your hand, we give you praise and thanks. And thank you for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ and everything that we do and everything that we give answers your love for us. Amen. We'll let the Alleluia continue, but let's only sing two verses, first and last verses of 260. Alleluia. Sing to Jesus. If you'll look up to me, I'll uh, give to you the blessing of God the Almighty, but also reach and take the hand of one next to you and receive the blessing from your brothers and your sisters. Now, Father, we come to go into the world, and the doors will be opened, and the world will be ours as it is yours. Give us grace by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that in our own way, at our own table, in our own time, we might be a blessing to this world. And to that end, may God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless us, now and forever. Amen.